This is a story where we are going back in time to Christmas Day 1929 and the longest missing person in the new Irish Free State, Larry Griffin. There are many characters in the story and attention is needed. So I may give you a little Irish history lesson that will be short and sweet on how things were back then and where Ireland was as far as independence from British rule. We as a nation had been under British rule, but in 1916 we had the Rising, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. This would lead to the War of Independence. In the end, a treaty was drawn up where the British returned 26 counties out of the 32 counties, with stipulations that I won't go into or will be here all day. So you had some of the Irish people that agreed to it. 26 counties was better than none. These people were pro-treaty. And then you had the anti-treaty, which wanted all the counties returned. In 1922, the Irish Free State was established, known today as the Republic of Ireland, leaving the other six counties as part of the UK, known today as Northern Ireland. So by 1929, the new Republic was a new concept, with a new government and for the first time, Ireland was trying to stand on its own two feet and not everything was up to scratch. Larry Griffin was born in Waterford in 1880 and was the youngest of six children. In 1899, at the age of 19, he joined the British Army. At that time, as an Irishman, he would have been frowned upon for doing this. But the money was good and there wasn't an actual Irish army available as Ireland was under British rule. He served in India for six years and later fought in France during the First World War. He was eventually discharged from the army for medical reasons after he was injured leaving him with a part missing ear, loss of teeth and a damaged arm. It was quite common back then for ex-army veterans to be given a job as a postman, which I might add, it was the British Royal Mail. He continued his job as a postman after Ireland became a republic. So he returned to his native Waterford and met and married his wife Mary in 1907. And they had a total of five children. But by 1929, only three of the children were still alive. The family lived in the town of Kilmac Thomas, County Waterford, and Larry would collect his posts there and travel the eight miles to the village of Strad Valley to deliver the post. On Christmas Day 1929 was one of those days. It was business as usual, but with some perks. Larry went to morning mass and delivered gifts to his neighbour's young daughters before setting off on his rounds. His son Jack and daughter Alice had plans to go to a local dance that night and he promised to be back in time to give them money in order to attend the dance. I may add here that it was tradition to give your local postman money, gifts, dinner and or a drink to say thank you for their service for the year. My own grandfather was a postman and it was his favourite time of year. He was a roaring alcoholic though so it definitely suited him to be rewarded with the drink. Larry had meals with two different families in Stradbally. A local farmer, John Cunningham, had planned to offer Larry a drink, but by the time he got to his house after 5 p.m., John could tell he was well oiled already and decided against giving him any more drink. Larry was expected home in Kilmac Thomas between 8 p.m. and 9, but 9 p.m. came and went without any sign of him. It had begun to snow around 7 p.m. that evening and Mary knew that her husband would have been offered drink all through the day. So she thought that Larry had decided to stay in Strab Alley that night rather than try to make his way home in a stupor. Larry was very well liked in Strab Alley, despite him having served with the British Army and he had plenty of friends he could have stayed with that night. Mary was not the only one waiting on Larry that night. The postmaster, Mr. Brown in Kilmac Thomas, had been expecting Larry to return after finishing work for the day. When he didn't arrive, Mr. Brown called to Mary just after midnight looking for him. When Mary informed him that Larry never arrived home, he tried to assure her that Larry was fine. Mary was still worried all the same and she waited up all night, hoping that Larry would come home. On the 26th of December, the next morning at around 730 a man named David Connors was out for a walk 
and he came across Larry's postman issued bike on the road about two miles outside Strad Valley on the Strad Valley to Kilmac Thomas Road. The bike seemed to be placed carefully on the road in the direction of Kilmac Thomas and it was also dry which was unusual as it should have been wet from the snow. David Connors notified the Gardaí in Strad Valley of his find and when the Gardaí arrived at the scene they took it that Larry was probably heavily intoxicated and had abandoned his bike on the way home. But by the afternoon after talking to Larry's wife Mary they feared maybe he had not just wandered off and if he had maybe some harm had come to him. Other postmen and friends of Larry's started searching the area for him. One of these postmen soon realised that Larry's bike may have been staged as it was packed unlike how a postman would do it. Larry's cape was folded and tied to the back carrier and normally a postman would not do this as they had a tendency to fly up when the bike was in motion. A witness would later come forward and say he had walked this particular road at 4am on the 26th and the bicycle had not been there. Soon the small scale search would expand. Bogs and small bodies of water were dragged. Within a few days nearly a six mile radius extending from where Larry's bicycle was found. But despite this no sign of him was found. Chief Superintendent O'Mara from Waterford got involved in the investigation on the 27th of December and on the 6th of January 1930 he received a tip from the local priest that he needed to speak with 16 year old John Power. He was interviewed at Strad Valley Garda Barracks the next day and he told Gardaí that he had been in Strad Valley Square with three friends at 6pm near a place called Whelan's Corner. At 6.30pm Larry and Garda Edward Delay walked past them with Garda Delay pushing Larry's bike for him. John believed that Larry was pretty drunk because he was leaning on Garda Delay's shoulder and appeared to stop and try to vomit just before he turned the corner. The other three men that were with John were also brought in for interview and confirmed what John had said. Garda Delay had previously reported that a witness had seen Larry on the road to Kilmac Thomas a mile outside of the village which would imply that Larry was already on his way home at this time and that Larry was sober that night. When Chief Superintendent O'Mara questioned Garda Delay again after the interview with John Power and the others Garda Delay stuck to what he had reported about Larry but did admit that he did see Larry that evening. He said he did not report this as he did not deem it important even though it would mean he was one of the last people to see Larry before he went missing. There was also other problems with Garda Delay's account. He claimed that he and Larry walked and talked up to the first turn on the Kilmac Thomas Road leading out of the village. Then Garda Delay said he turned around and walked past John Power and the other three men that were standing on Whelan's corner. He then said he waited for Sissy Whelan and they went down to the cove together. She was the daughter of the Whelan family that owned the pub. He was courting her at the time. However, the four men said they had not seen Garda Delay come back at all. Chief Superintendent O'Mara was losing confidence in what he was being told by Gardaí he interviewed. Irregularities in their statements and in their official records began to pile up. Rumours surfaced also that another Garda from Strabali Barracks, Garda Murphy, had visited Larry O'Brien, one of the three men who had been with John Power on Whelan's Corner. He told him to keep quiet on what he had seen that evening on Christmas Day. Garda Murphy's movements that were recorded for that night had him on patrol from 5pm to 8.30pm. He claimed to have seen two men during this time, but both these men were interviewed said that it was untrue. Garda Murphy also said he went immediately back to the Garda barracks after his patrol, but the orderly at the barracks said he did not return until 10.30pm and he was with Garda Delay when he did. I'm not sure if you're aware, but back then Gardaí, who were single, actually lived at the Garda barracks and any Gardaí who were married with families would live in a house within the area. This is why they were called Garda barracks and not Garda stations. Garda Delay and Garda Murphy socialised in Whelan's pub quite often. 
mainly because they both liked to drink and also because Garda DeLay was courting Sissy Whelan and Garda Murphy was courting Sissy's sister Nora. This was the source of contention for the two Gardies sergeant as he was always catching them in the pub when they were supposed to be on patrol. Christmas Day was no different. He went to Whelan's pub twice that evening, once to make sure Whelan's weren't serving as it was illegal to serve drink on Christmas Day and Good Friday in those days. It wasn't long before the first visit by the sergeant that Larry had been seen outside of the pub. It was said Larry had finished his last delivery around 6pm. Then he and Garda DeLay had visited another Garda, Garda Frawley. He lived in a flat above the post office, which was beside Whelan's pub. Larry was very drunk when he arrived at the flat and had even more to drink there. The two Gardaí eventually took Larry outside and debated what to do with him. Garda Frawley went to the pub to ask if Larry could stay there for the night. But across the road, Sergeant Colnan saw him go into the pub and followed him in thinking he would be catching some of his guards drinking. Garda Frawley realised he was being followed and walked back out of the pub. He warned Delay that the sergeant was nearby. Garda Delay then walked Larry past John Parr and his three friends. None of this information was put on record by the two Gardaí involved. Later witness statements would show that after Garda Delay and Larry turned the corner and out of view of John Power and the others, they went around the back of the pub and through the gate into the pub. The pub was run by Patrick Whelan and his wife Bridget. The pub was not doing well at this time. Patrick owed money to his landlord and had been sued for not paying his suppliers. So Patrick, when interviewed by Gardaí, had no good reason to tell the truth. He told them that he had not seen Larry that day at all and he definitely had not been in the pub that evening. However, when three friends of Larry's had come from Kilmac Thomas on the 26th of December looking for him and before the official investigation had started, Patrick Whelan had told them he had seen Larry that day and he had had a conversation with him about going home and sleeping it off but Larry refused to go home. Patrick Whelan also denied serving alcohol on Christmas Day and no one outside his family had been in the pub. But two witnesses, Jack Calvin and Eddie Dunphy, came forward and said they both had been drinking at the pub that day but were drinking in the kitchen and didn't see who was drinking in the bar of the pub. They also said Sissy was on the premises that evening which would contradict what Garda DeLay had said about being with her at the cove. Sissy would also say she was with Garda DeLay, but when she was confronted with the witnesses who saw her in the pub that night, she claimed that she and DeLay had been spending time in a shed behind the pub and she would periodically go back inside so her mother wouldn't become suspicious of her whereabouts. You see, our Sissy was not supposed to be courting back then. With all the comings and goings and the lies that were being found out, Whelan's pub was becoming the centre of the investigation into Larry's disappearance. It would be nearly a month before the Gardaí would get a true idea of what exactly might have gone on in Whelan's pub that night. On the January the 30th, 1930, Gardaí brought in 25-year-old Thomas Corbett, a local labourer, to ask him some questions. He was accompanied by another man, James Fitzgerald. James was a bachelor twice Thomas's age, who had taken in Thomas and his pregnant wife. While Thomas was giving his statement, James started chatting with Chief Superintendent O'Mara. He told him that he, Thomas and two other friends were in Whelan's pub that Christmas night and they were drinking there. They were in the kitchen, but there were also people drinking in the bar. He said that Larry was there also and at some stage during the evening he had dropped three coins. The local gravedigger, Ned Morrissey, picked them up and used them to buy drinks. Larry and Ned got into an argument which turned into a scuffle. Ned put his leg out and tripped Larry. As he fell, Larry hit his head on a stove. Larry was not moving and Ned turned him over onto his back and they all quickly realised he was dead. Patrick Whelan freaked out and told Ned that his life was over because he had killed a man in his pub. With all the commotion, everyone gathered in the bar. Ned offered the solution of getting rid of the body, thereby getting rid of any evidence that something had happened to Larry, much less at Whelan's pub. 
One man that was at the pub that night was the principal of the local national school, Thomas Cashin. He owned the only car in the village and had used it to drive Garda Delay and Murphy around to try and find Larry on the 26th of December. According to James Fitzgerald, he had used the same car on Christmas night to remove the body of Larry from the pub. So we have Ned Morrissey, the gravedigger, Patrick Whelan, the owner of the pub, Thomas Cashin, the school principal, and another man, George Cummins. They wrapped Larry in a blanket and placed him in Thomas Cashin's car. There was a discussion between them all before they left on where best to dump poor Larry. And it is said they settled on putting him in an old copper mine in the area. Garda Delay then took Larry's bicycle and promised to dump it along the Kilmac Thomas Road outside the village of Strat Valley and Garda Murphy went with him. While James Fitzgerald was giving this detailed account of Larry's death to Chief Superintendent O'Mara, Thomas Corbett was providing a completely different story. He said that he and James Fitzgerald had gone to Whelan's pub that evening but had not been let inside. They then went to another pub in the village and then onto a car game where Thomas got into a fist fight. The two other men that James said had gone with them to Whelan's pub denied they were there. But the Gardaí did feel James's account was most likely the nearest to the truth, even though they could only corroborate some of the information. Because James pointed the finger at so many people within the village, he felt unsafe. The Gardaí brought him to Waterford City, where he was held as a protective witness. Gardaí arrested Thomas Cashin and Ned Morrissey the following morning, and they were taken to court and charged with the murder of Larry disposing of his body, obstructing the coroner's inquest and stealing his postman's bag and hat, which were legally the property of the state. Two days later, Patrick Whelan, George Cummins, Patrick Cunningham, Bridget Whelan, the wife of Patrick, their daughter Nora and son Jack were then arrested also. Sissy and the Whelan's youngest son were the only two members of the family that weren't arrested. Why Sissy wasn't arrested, I don't know, as she had obviously been there that night and she had lied about being with Garda Delay at the Cove. Garda Delay and Murphy were also arrested on February 3rd, 1930. This brought the number of accused to 10. On February the 7th, the first preliminary hearing in the case was held at the Waterford Courthouse. The star witness was James Fitzgerald and his testimony started out as the statement he had given, but then everything changed. He said he had gone to Whelan's for a drink, but he never went inside. That his drink was handed out to him, as were the drink for the men he was with, and they also never went inside. His new account was more in line with Thomas Corbett's story. They went to a different pub and then went to play cards. The prosecution were not happy and blindsided by James changing his account. Even on the morning of the trial before court began, James was sticking to his story only changing one detail, that Larry was still breathing when they wrapped him in the blanket. This was to be huge for the prosecution as it would define the case as definite murder. The prosecution asked for a stay of one week and it was granted and the accused were to be remanded in custody. Gardy needed to find Larry's body, without it the trial would collapse. The copper mines in the area were searched using James's original story in the hope that he was telling the truth. They also dug up 24 recent graves, over six graveyards, working only at night. This happened as Ned Morrissey was the local grave digger and he was the one, it was said, that travelled in the car with the school principal, Thomas Cashin, to help get rid of the body. Bodies of water in local farms were searched and still Larry's body could not be found. On February the 14th, court was resumed and the prosecution had to rely on witnesses whose testimony only provided circumstantial or inexact evidence against the 10 accused. The stove and floorboards had been taken out of the pub for examination. There was no blood found on these items. Blood was found in the car of Thomas Cashin, but they didn't have the technology to prove whether it was human blood or not, as there was not a big enough sample. It was said also that while Ned and Larry were fighting in the pub, Thomas Cashin got involved and hit Larry and this is what caused Larry to fall and hit his head. 
There was bad blood between Larry and Thomas Cashin, the principal. Cashin wanted his post delivered before he went to work and Larry, because he was so friendly and chatty, would get delayed delivering the post. Cashin even reported Larry to the postmaster. Also, Cashin was anti-treaty and involved in the Republican movement and the IRA, and he held a grudge against Larry because he served in the British Army. The prosecution returned to court again on the 21st of February, and John Parr and his three friends testified and stuck to their story. Garda Frawley's wife gave testimony that Larry had been in her flat. He had been very drunk and that her husband and Garda Delay had all left together and her husband returned a short while later. On the 1st of March, the prosecution asked for one last adjournment in order to either find the body or get new evidence. This was granted and the defendants remained behind bars. The following week on the 7th of March, the case was heard once again, but unfortunately Larry was not found and they had no new evidence, so the case was dropped. Garda DeLay and Murphy were ordered to get the first train back to Dublin and the other eight defendants were released and went out for dinner in Waterford, later returning to Stradbally for celebrations. The Garda Commissioner was fuming over the trial collapsing and blamed Chief Superintendent O'Mara, so he brought in Superintendent Hunt from Galway to take over the investigation which was a real kick in the teeth for O'Mara, as Hunt was below him in rank. After the trial, James Fitzgerald was a social outcast, even though he didn't follow through on his original statement. He couldn't get work and was getting death threats. James would eventually disappear and he would be reported missing. But what happened was he was contacted by Superintendent Hunt and he told him he could get him out of Stradbally and keep him safe if he would tell the truth of where Larry's body was. So Hunt got James a job with a farmer in Galway and a few weeks later they both met up and James told him everything. James basically said that on Christmas Day he went to Whelan's pub and went in the back way and had a drink. He said Larry was there with guarded delay. He said he met the other three men, Corbett, Cunningham and Cummins, outside the pub after he left. They did have a drink outside Whelan's that was passed out to them. They then all went to the other pubs and onto the hall to play cards, where Thomas Corbett did get into a fight. Corbett, Cunningham and James then left the hall. Corbett and James went in one direction as they both lived together and Cunningham went in another direction towards home. Cunningham, however, did not go straight home. He went to Whelan's pub. James claimed that he had heard about Larry's accidental death from Corbett and he had heard it from Cunningham. Cunningham had stopped into Whelan's on his way home and had witnessed an argument on Larry's death sometime around 11.30pm on Christmas night. Even though James claimed that what Corbett told him came from Cunningham about Larry's actual death, the other details about the disposal of Larry's body was rumours from people in the village. James admitted that the only outright lie was the blanket that Larry's body was wrapped in. It is possible that James was relaying the actual truth of what happened to Larry. His case still remains unsolved and James's account could not be verified. There was plenty of reasons for people not to come forward, to tell the truth and tell where Larry's body was, even if it was an accident. You see, if it happened at Whelan's pub, there was illegal drinking going on and that would put Whelan's license at risk. If there were Gardaí on the premises also drinking, well, that would have got them into trouble. Cash in the school principal was already in trouble with the Department of Education for not having a qualification in the Irish language and then being associated with illegal drinking and a scandal of a death where he was present could have got him fired. While Larry may have not been murdered, charges of manslaughter could have been brought against all aforementioned. This is also sad, as especially these people were respected members of the community and friends to Larry. They put themselves before decency and got rid of the body in order to save their own skin. There was also rumours that Larry died at the Strat Valley Garda Barracks and allegations that it was Cashin that was involved in Larry's death and not Ned. As it was said, that Ned wouldn't have been allowed into the pub that day as he was only a grave digger and didn't have a high social standing 
and he wouldn't have got the same privilege of a principal a Garda or other high-ranking citizens of the village. The Gardaí did follow up on many rumours, including one where it was said that Larry was in a local bog. The bog was searched, but no body was ever recovered. Cashin was suspended from his job as principal when he was arrested, and he thought when the trial was over, he would get his job back straight away. But it wouldn't be until December 1930 when he would be reinstated. Corbett actually sued the Gardaí for assault and false imprisonment and won a settlement of £1,000. Gardaí involved in the case, including DeLay, Murphy, Frawley and O'Sullivan, were all fired. Chief Superintendent O'Mara was transferred and Superintendent Hunt returned to Galway. Patrick Whelan sued Waterford newspaper and got £1,740 in the settlement. £700 of this was immediately taken by his creditors. He also took out a lawsuit against the Cork Examiner newspaper and won. So what happened to Larry on that night is still unknown to this day. Was it an accident and where is his body? Mary, his wife, died in 1958 and all she wanted was his body to be found so he could be buried with her. It is said there was roadworks locally at the time and Larry was dumped and tarmacked over the next morning. But years later, in 2012, this road would be examined and no body would be found. If Cashin was involved in Larry's death and he being a member of the IRA, they could have helped him get rid of the body, as it is well known that the IRA were very good at getting rid of bodies. Larry's grandchildren continued the search for him. Because the case was unresolved, the files from the official investigation were not publicly released and they were kept from the public long after the deaths of the people involved in the case. In 2009, an RTE television programme covered the case and questioned why these files had not been made public. Because of the public pressure, the Gardaí made many of these files available. There is more to Larry's legacy than the circumstances of his death and the mystery behind what happened to his body. He was greatly loved and it is shown by how his family still look for him and have not let his memory die. All they want for him is to receive a Christian burial and to be laid beside his beloved wife Mary.